Okay, let's start. Welcome everyone to our core facility seminar series. For those of you who do not know me, I am Lisa Korpieski, the Director of Communications and Marketing here at the Institute for Applied Life Sciences. This is our ninth and last seminar of the semester and we are busy planning for the spring. Today, we will be learning about the resources available in our biophysical characterization facility with the director, Liz Bartlett, as well as our guest speaker, Dr. Lake Paul from Bioanalysis LLC on how their company uses biophysical analytical chemistry techniques. We are hoping that with these biweekly seminars, you will discover what great resources that the centralized UMass Amherst core facilities offer to our campus community, the New England region and beyond. Next, just a few housekeeping items. This seminar is being recorded. If you miss any part of the seminar or would like to forward it to someone who cannot attend, there will be a replay of this and all previous seminars in this series on our website. We will put the link in the chat. I recommend you set your view mode to speaker. Please stay muted during the talks. We will save the Q&A until the end of the presentation. During that time, I welcome you to unmute yourself and ask your question. Also, you can put your questions into the chat, which I will be monitoring. Next up, on behalf of Andrew Bernard, I would like to tell you about our UMass Amherst core facilities. If you have not interacted with us very much, the UMass core facilities are open to anyone from undergrads through senior scientists, regardless of affiliation, including researchers from other academic institutions and commercial partners. From sending samples for analysis, to designs for 3D printing, to becoming a trained user on advanced imaging instrumentation, there are many opportunities for engagement, no matter your level of expertise. Additionally, there are many opportunities to fund your work in the course. For UMass users, there are several seed funding programs and core credits that are available to all IELTS faculty members. For our external users, the Mass Innovation Voucher Program subsidizes usage for small companies based in Massachusetts up to 75%. Over the last two years, Across the five UMass campuses, we have awarded more than 400 vouchers representing more than $5 million in project costs. If you happen to be a MassBio member, there is also a 10% discount you may be eligible for. We are here to be your partner and to help expand your research productivity. Please feel free to reach out to Andrew or any of the core facilities directors if you have any questions or would like more information. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Liz Bartlett. Liz has been working in IELTS as the director of the Biophysical Core for over four years, bringing with her 13 years of experience as the lead formulation scientist at Immugen, as well as 10 years as a lead scientist in drug product discovery at Genetics Institute, currently Pfizer. She is also an alum of UMass Amherst and Lowell. Prior to the pandemic, when not in the lab, she could be found coffee and camera in hand, shooting breathtaking photos across the country. Thank you. Now I'll hand it over to you, Liz. You're muted. Mute myself, here we go. Still getting used to Zoom, it's only been eight months. Um, I'm the director of the Biophysical Characterization Lab. And what we do is we provide instrumentation and expertise um, for the research communities um, in Western Massachusetts, Boston area, um, and around the country. We also work with um, industrial partners to do the research and get, gather data um, crucial for their research. Um, let's see. The toolbox that we have is a very extensive one in the, in the lab, and it's broken down into four basic categories. Um, molecular interactions, structure and physical characterization, crystallization, and imaging. So we've got a, a Biotech Synergy 2 plate reader, an auto ITC, um, which basically uh, allows researchers to just um, put their samples in a 96 well plate, push a button and walk away, come back and gather data. Um, a BIACOR for looking at molecular interactions, um, kinetics and thermodynamic data, and 
uh, nanotemper monolith microscale thermophoresis, which also gives us binding characteristics. Um, and it's very appealing to start a lot of research because it's very small um, investment in time and, re and sample. For structure and physical characterization, we've got a JASCO CD so that we can look at secondary structures. Um, we can also look at fluorescence and we can do thermal characterizations as well with that. A Beckman analytical ultracentrifuge, um, where we can look at both sedimentation equilibrium and sedimentation velocity, which gives us an idea of size distributions, but we can also measure molecular weights and um, thermodynamic data. There's a Wyatt SEC MALS, which allows us to measure the absolute molar mass of either um, complexes or individual proteins. And a zeta sizer is a dynamic light scattering instrument that <clears throat> allows us to um, look at particle sizes. Crystallization, we have a home source, Regaku Extalab, which allows up to or down to two angstrom uh, resolution on crystal structures. There's a biosax for looking at structures within solution and a formulatrix crystallization robot that allows us to formulate 96 well plates, <clears throat> set protein in, and also a, uh, an imager that allows us to look at the crystal formations. And then imaging, these instruments get a lot of work. Um, an, a LICOR Odyssey um, scanner and a GE Typhoon. Oops. So how can people work with us? Well, we have the, the state-of-the-art facility located in here in the um, life science laboratory. And there's 15 different instruments. And we can work with students, faculty, and industry scientists. And you can either come, be trained, or if you already know how to use the instrument, um, have access to it to run your experiments, or um, you can send us samples and we can run them as well. Um, and we can analyze the data, create a report, send you samples back. And, and work with you to design future experiments um, after that. And it's a collaborative um, way of working that, that we have um, to be able to design, collect the data, interpret, and hopefully partner. So one of the highlights was working um, early on with uh, Dr. Elizabeth Haglin um, and her PI, Lynn Marie Thompson, they had a particular problem of looking at these very intricate uh, complex formations. And together we worked through um, a, a series of experiments to try to answer some, some questions. And one of the interesting parts was that Elizabeth also did the cover art for her article in biochemistry. So after about two years of, of, of work and um, collaboration, she earned her PhD and she's now at a company in Seattle called Aptivo Therapeutics. And this is me. Um, as uh, Lisa mentioned, I, after um, my experience here uh, at UMass in Amherst, I started here roughly about the time that the dinosaurs went extinct. Um, so that was a long time ago. Um, from there, I, I worked um, in industry, most, mostly as a uh, formulation scientist. Um, but part of that is looking at the impact that different excipients will have on physical structures of the proteins and their stabilities. And so that's the skill set that I, I learned. And that I brought here. So my expertise are analytical ultracentrifugation, light scattering techniques, spectroscopy, and um, analytical chromatography. Everything from size exclusion to ion exchange and reverse phase. Oops. So 
thank you for your attention. Any, you know, if you have questions uh, that <clears throat> are probably beyond what might happen in the question and answer period, you can uh, send me an email or you can give me a call. I'm here uh, in the life science labs most days and uh, we can talk about prices and designing experiments and all of that. So it's my pleasure to introduce Lake Paul, who um, I have the pleasure of being able to work with. Um, and we've been working together for two years now, something like that, close to, close two, to years. two years. Yes. Yeah. And um, doing a lot of very interesting centrifuge work um, beyond what I've normally done. So I'll let Lake introduce himself and, and just go right into the um, into his presentation. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you, Liz, um, for the, the introduction. Um, what I'm going to do is just tell you a quick um, biography of myself um, and what I have been um, been doing over the last um, two years, um, year and a half, over a year and a half now, and how my company has come about and so forth. So I'm the president of um, Bioanalysis LSC. Um, we are a biophysics and mass spec um, CRO, non-clinical CRO. We provide services mainly in um, the gene therapy field. And as everyone know, um, is who is aware, gene therapy has been taken off for the last um, um, 20 years, but we had some setbacks, but over the last five or six years, it has exploded. There are two products on the market right now, um, Luxterna and Zogia Messia, um, that has basically been transformative medicines in the, um, the, in the medicinal field. So it's very promising techniques and very promising um, uh, medicine for a lot of the rare diseases. And right now, it's in its infancy in terms of what we're um, what we're doing in terms of um, the diseases we're um, looking at. So right now it's just ultra rare diseases, rare diseases, but this can be applied to, for example, sickle cell or maybe even Alzheimer or maybe even some of these pr um, common diseases that is known. But one of the things is um, that we have to realize is that biophysics plays a very important role in these gene therapy based off the delivery systems. So a lot of gene therapy uses AAVs, uh, then associated viruses, lentiviruses, adenoviruses, sometimes even um, murine leukemia virus, and even nanoparticles. So these, lend, these type of systems lend itself to be characterized very well by biophysical techniques. And I'm gonna focus on analytical simplification a little bit, uh, a lot in this talk, but before we go into that, I want to give you what is being done um, for the uh, AAV system. So when you're looking at um, AAV systems, you're thinking about the identity, safety, purity, and characterization. And these are basically the critical quality attributes or CQAs of this um, system. So re basically what you're looking for identity, you're looking at peptide mapping, your plasmid, and you know, protein concentrations and so forth. For characterization, you have to look at the, the post-transitional modification of the, of the vectors, uh, um, of the capsids. This is, can be done through mass spec, host cell proteins. And in this case, this is where um, AUC comes, um, plays a, big, a very big role. You can look at either higher or lower order structure, um, higher, or, higher or lower order capsids, and then contaminants in there. But mainly, AUC is used for quantitation of the capsids, um, quantitation of, of the, the, the virus itself. So you're looking at you know, empty capsids, partial capsids, which is also called intermediate capsids, your full capsids, and you can provide an absolute quantitation of it um, using AUC. Um, this technique can also go into the CGMP QC environment. So you develop a method and it, it can be very powerful in release tests in terms of um, your IND or BLA um, enabling activities. 
you can look at the virus loading of the particle, process and manufacturing consistencies, um, aggregates, and this is a little bit um, complicated with the higher order um, capsids, aka the aggregates. And then you can determine all the other hydrodynamic physical ca um, um, capabilities of it. But before I get into that, what techniques do we see in gene therapy in terms of characterizing the capsids? So traditional um, techniques we um, we look um, look at is DLS and AUC, and as as Liz said, she has the zeta size in there, so you can get you know a qualitative, a very important, a qualitative assessment of your aggregates using DLS and AUC. Um, in addition to that, we have size distribution, so a lot of companies are coming out with um, techniques to look at these capsid species. For example, SecMOLS um, is, is a good alternative, very quick, very, um, very easy. Um, um, IEF, um, uh, capillary um, isoelectric focusing to look at your um, quantitation of all your charge variants in your um, capsids. And then you have TEM and CRIEM to look at, you know, these type of size distribution. However, one of the things we have to be very careful with is that your your each one of these techniques are are missing some information. Uh, for example, if you look at the chromatogram here, this is basically um, empty and full. There's no partials being uh, resolved in this, and a lot of these techniques are missing some of the intricacies of the system, and that's where AUC really shines in this case. Other approaches such as um, 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 and um, AEX chromatography can do the same, uh, but again, it, it is very, very um, um, limited in what it can do. Um, also, we, we have certain techniques as charge distribution mass spectrometry, um, which can give you a good idea of the empty, partial, and full, but it's limited in some of the, um, the very large particles that might be there. And plus that particular technique is not ready for um, CGMP and AUC, um, CGMP and QC release. So what I'm gonna really focus on is what is AUC and what are we doing with, um, with this? So a little bit of history, because I like to see you know, where, we, where we were and where we have evolved to. So basically, this what I'm showing you here is the first centrifuge that Theodor Svedberg built in Uppsala, actually in Wisconsin, but this one is now in um, Uppsala, Sweden, and this is where it was in 1928. So it took up two floors actually, and um, they actually um, um, a, um, took away one of the women's bathroom to to uh, put um, the part of the centrifuge in, which is not a good thing to do. But anyways, um, this was the original um, um, centrifuge. And then what happened is that over the years, the centrifuge evolved into the Model E, and then we finally got the XLA and XLI um, in there. So this is the Model E, and this is the XLA and XLI in my, my own old research lab that I had. And then nowadays, we have the new Optima AUC, which is um, pretty um, pretty powerful instrument I'll bet there are certain things with it that is um, that needs to be upgraded. Um, so what what are we looking at AUC? So AUC doesn't require any special matrix, any immobilization, any um, special handling. It's a basically what we call a first principle application. So basically, what you put in is what you get out. And the usual saying is GIGO: garbage in, garbage out. So there's no manipulation of the sample besides um, pipetting it into a um, centrifuge cell and applying a angular velocity to it. And over the years, this technique has become very, um, very available to uh, people um, to, to learn it. It's not a, it's a very simple experimental setup. However, the, the brunt of the analysis is during the analysis, the, the heavy lifting is during the analysis. So basically over the years, different um, people such as Peter Schuch, Boris Lemier, Tom Lowey, Walter Stafford, uh, Arthur Rowe, Stephen Hardin, all of these Javantis have, uh, have really expanded the field to really make it more accessible 
to um, um, everyone because it does require a lot of mathematical com com uh, computations. So we have new um, fitting methods to, such as regularization and least square minimization to really aid in this. In addition to that, we have much more user-friendly software that really helps um, parse out the fitting and make the fitting available to everyone, such as DCDT, Set and Now, Autoscan, and my two favorites from Peter, it's a set fit and set fat. So a lot of this work, this technique is over 90 years old, and it's kind of wonderful to see that it comes full circle from 1928 to, to, to 2020, um, 2020, and what we are seeing is that a lot of the, the characterization that has been done, has all, uh, that is being conducted now, has already been done before. So if we look at you know extensive studies on viruses such as the the bro mosaic virus, AVs, um, and um, tobacco mosaic virus, this technique no, doesn't only lend itself to these viruses; it lends itself to polymers actually. The first AUC experiment was ran on a gold colloid, which is basically a nanoparticle size um, system. So it can analyze nanoparticles and these any basically anything that's in solution, it can analyze and even suspend it, it can too. So some of these things, you know, some of the the techniques have already been the methods, sorry, the methods have already been developed during the 50s. For example, the first evidence of cell sharpening that occurred in the bromas um Back of mosaic virus by Holly Schachmann um, is has been you know characterized and, and and very well studied. These same principles apply to what we do now. So what I want to look at is basically what are we talking about in terms of um, the AUC and the gene therapy field. Remember, I said you want to look at your capsid distribution. So one of the major um, CQA is your percent empty. And what, is, what this does, this is the gold standard. Again, a very multi -stand, uh, multifaceted technique, and it's the gold standard for particle characterization. However, again, you don't need any dilutions, and you have these wonderful inter intraassay reproducibility. I mean, if you look at it, it's 1 to 1.5% standard deviation. You can get LODs for methods less than a percent. And you know you can get LOQs based off the ICHQ two R one guidelines of basically one to fifteen percent, one point five percent of a quantitation. And I just I just repeating what I just said. You know you have experiment is in native um, matrices compatible with many systems, biological and non biological. And you know you can really establish some of the CQAs very easily um, with the AUC. So what do you get from um, these particular experiments? So basically you get a wide, uh, you have a very wide side distribution range. Basically you can look at different size particles depending on your road to speed. It's independent of reaction kinetics. So this is basically, if you're looking at um, an interaction, so you can look at uh, 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 two molecules interacting, you don't have to worry about, you know, it, whether it is a fast equilibrium set, um, system or a slow equilibrium system. What I mean by that, for example, if you have an SCC column and you have a very fast equilibrium system um, in which you have a, um, two in molecules interacting, if it's very fast, you're not going to capture it in an SCC um, system, in an SCC because of dilution. If you have a very slow equilibrium system, say T to the um, um, a half life of basically um, 10 to the minus seconds or so, uh, sorry, a half-life of many days, uh, the, uh, the K off is 10 to the minus five, you will have a stable, hydrogen stable system which you can ca um, capture. These, you, do, you don't have to worry about these type of limitations when you're looking at um, AUC. You also get molecular weights, shape, radius, diffusion coefficient. So everything you get from a DLS, a sec moles, you can also get from AUC, all in one experiment. Okay, so it's very, very robust. So again, you know what? What are we looking at with AUC? So we look at um, capsid quantitation, higher order um, capsid characterization, intracapsid heterogeneity, which I'll talk about a little bit um, today. Um, DNA capsid loading and contaminants. So basically, 
what we're looking at here uh, to focus in, I, I showed that you can um, measure your empty capsids. But if you have a stable um, higher order capsid or aggregate, you can also measure it, uh, measure this. It's kind of difficult if it's very heterogeneous um, to measure it with AUC or anything for that matter. But if you have something, uh, an aggregate that is very stable um, and it's consistent, you can really go down to very low, um, low LODs and LOQs, kind of akin to your dimer of your, um, of your antibody. Okay, if that's a pretty common aggregate, as we will call it. But you know, if it's very stable, you can really measure um, not only your, your percent um, capsids, but also high order um, um, capsids. Not to mention, you can also look at your contaminants. This will be picked up by your AUC. One of the common contaminants you see in a gene therapy field is REP68, which is, um, it's a, um, it aids in the uptake of the DNA into the, or RNA into the, your, 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 your um, viral particle. This can be one of the common um, um, contaminants in there. And there are quite a few papers that has been analyzed um, using, by, uh, analyzed the system, being analyzed by AUC that have proven this out. So one of the things I want to talk about is basically what do, you, what do I mean by um, intracapsid heterogeneity? So usually these experiments um, are, ran, are run at a very low speed, so maybe 12,000, maybe 15,000 RPM um, because of the size and nature of the particle. In an ideal world, you'll get a CFS distribution that has you know, an empty capsid, zero um, intermediates and a full capsid, okay? Now, if you look at this, this looks like a very singular peak, but what you can see in here, this is a simulation that I did. What I did is basically I said, okay, we have 10% of empty, and I, I'll, I made three full capsid species, each separated by a sedimentation coefficient of 5%, uh, 5S, and I gave them increasing um, um, concentrations. This data here was modeled and gave me this, okay? I know for a fact that that data has three full capsid species. Um, so why did it show up? Um, why did not have, why didn't they discriminate? Well, because the S values were um, very close and at the given experimental conditions, we don't, we don't see it, it all kind of merges together. However, if you do some clever experimentation, you can separate out these species, these species and get your um, intracapsid um, heterogeneity. So in this case, now as we change experimental conditions, you can now see that the, that particular peak that we saw in the red over there, now deconvolute into the three species that we, uh, we, we looked at. And this is something that is unique to um, AUC. So for example, if you try to look at and multiple systems using, you know, um, cryem, cryem, or one of these uh, chromatography techniques, this type of resolution is not going to be seen. Um, these these very very small differences in your um, your capsid um, species with, when it's filled with DNA. Um, what 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 is the major functions? Wait, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. What did you, what did you change? Um, to get that resolution? Um, we change the fitting parameters and speed. You change the speed, okay. Change the speed, but it's not always linear. The speed is not always linear mm -hmm. um, to it because um, we found that there's some type of non-ideality dependent on the sample. Mm -hmm. So if you change the speed and you've changed some of the fitting parameters, you can really tease it out. And everything I, um, I do is geared towards uh, GMP is geared towards a release test. So this is not only just for characterization, it is also can we develop a method that will accurately um, give the same analytical responses every time with the fitting parameters and the experimental setup. So usually we do a, we rely heavily on the method development and when we go into the protocol val uh, validation, it's pretty much a checkbox, okay? Right, but but in here at least, but here you can you knew what you had in there, right? Mm -hmm. The parameters, like if you have something that you don't know, 
how far do you go? You know, how this much is based off of real world data. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, we didn't know. We oh, knew okay. when we did initially the experiments, we saw the peak. And I said, I said to myself and my team and I, we said to ourselves, this doesn't look right. So we did some additional modeling mm -hmm. simulations and we were like, okay, there are at least three species in there. When we came out, there was a lot more than three species. And we figured out that we need to increase the rotor speed and, and the fitting parameters to do this. So, so sometimes this happens. Yeah. Um, so we did not know a posteriori what was going on. Okay, so you have to do, it's a systematic um, and stepwise type of analysis that you have to do. You see the first and go to the bottom, you know? Thank you. So, great question, by the way. Um, so what I'm geared towards, a lot of this thing, and I just, um, Eugenia, I just, this, um, this asked a really good question, and I, it's basically the emphasis on the method development. So what we try to do is really focus on a robust method that will give us the um, um, the correct and correct analytical response that is reproducible at all time, and everything is basically um, um, geared towards that. Even though we do have, a, if you have a process development sample, a research sample, we do do the experimental the exper experiments that will tease out the, the the correct size distributions and so forth. But however, as we move, as the process gets locked down we are moving towards a more tight method control in that. Um, basically, one of the limitations that we have with um, um, the fitting softwares and so forth is they're not 21 CFR compliant. However, at Bioanalysis, we have come up with a way in which we um, can make our final output 21 CFR 11 compliant, and that's the program we wrote called Capsid Integrator. This is unique for every method. This is basically, once we have developed the method, we know our ranges, we know our percentages, we can plug and play at that point in time. And it's, it's an iterative process during the method development to really give you a robust CGMP QC method. Because the field is split in two, the AUC field is split into two. One, it's, one side says it is only for research purposes, and the other side, which on other camp, which is myself, which says it can be done to, for um, a, um, CGMP. And we're moving towards that now because it has been done before. Um, what else? Stability. You can help with identification and quantitation of derivation products. AUC will pick this up, okay? it will pick up um, these type of um, degradation products. During your process uh, development, if you're looking at uh, upstream and downstream changes, for example, you have a cell, cell bank, your cell bank has changed, your cell line has changed, what happens to your system? You're changing the ITR to ITR regions. You know, what, what, what impact does it have in your, your system? Um, in your capsid distribution, are you taking up more? Are you taking up less? Are you producing more intermediate capsids? Um, all of those things can be assessed during process development. And these, this kind of aid in the risk and um, strategy. So your mitigation for, the, um, for these type of strategies is through this um, AUC type of um, experiment. And finally, it's looking at comparability. So you're looking at batch to batch variances. How well are you making your product? How well are you making the same amount of full capsids? Is your empty capsids too high? Is, are you generating more of um, um, intermediate capsids or partial capsids? So you go, you, you know, you can really do um, the, um, the comparability compar 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 between the, uh, the batches. And this, this comes from a long line of the reproducibility of the AUC techniques. So the, for example, we all know the 70S ribosome. The S is Fedberg's. That, if you ran that now, you will get within plus or minus, might be 0.2 to 0.5 S differences, okay? So you are, it's very, very um, um, robust. And finally, um, just a quick announcement, I'm opening up a lab, a GMP lab that's gonna be functional in February. And so it's, it's wonderful that um, yeah, the AUC has been a, a part of it and I've used, Liz and I have been um, collaborating for the last two years and, and hopefully we'll have a 
longer collaboration after this. Uh, thank you, and if you have any questions, please let me know. Great, thank you. Is there, uh, does anybody have any questions for Lake or for Liz on using the facilities? Nothing. <laughs> I have a question. Oh, great. Thank I, you. Um, how do you, um, I know that I work with other techniques, not, not this one particularly. Um, and sometimes there is a lot, as you said it, it is a lot of um, the art of feeding your data, right? Um, and you can, and that process can be asymptotic, like it can take forever and you never get there. You know, is there any um, easy way, not easy way, but standard way to somewhere where you start and you say, okay, this is what I, I this is good enough. This is what I have. Uh, I'm done analyzing my data. This is what I get out of it. Yeah, that's a great question. Obviously, uh, Eugenia, you have fit multiple nonlinear fits before. <laughs> so what we do, um, so that's a great question. And what, we do um, there so two parts I'm on and break down into two sections the first section where do you start well we know where the, how the data is going to look okay we know what the capsids are we have added, we have broken down the system into components before mm -hmm. so a posteriori we know a capsid empty caps is going to be around 65s okay we know what that is going to look like the solutions that we have in the fitting, okay, are the be are basically the best we can do to describe the data. It's it's a model, okay. How do we know that models are is correct? That's basically what what your your what's the end goal? How do you know that model describes your data the best? Well, at the end of the day, you know, you we apply different algorithms to it, you know, different fitting parameters, different algorithms, and they all converge in the same thing. Now, what we also see, this, this technique has been backed up over the, you know, it has a long history of being proven out. And the mm -hmm. programs that we use are usually very robust in that. Now, we don't leave it as a black box, okay? Right. We know exactly how this system is. So we, every knowledge, every knowledge that we have prior to that goes into the fitting. So it's just not blind, okay? We know how the capsule should look. We know what it should be hydrodynamically. We can do the simple math mathematical equations for sedimentation by hand and okay. figure out here, here's the sedimentation. So we confirm what those fits are by just doing simple calculations by hand, okay? So we know what the S value is. We know, we know what, we, we have everything we need. So the best, what, what, is, what is critical though, is what is the best fit that you can get? How do you arrive to that? And that is where the method development comes into place, come into play. You go through that exercise. You go through <laughs> that, that thorough exercise of saying, hey, I'm gonna use X algorithm to describe the data, and do we have the same values that we're getting? Um, does it, co um, does it um, correlate with what we have by hand? And everything we have been doing, um, orthogonal techniques, basically support what we have. But, but the problem, the thing is, is that the orthogonal techniques usually use AUC as the confirmation. <laughs> so that's, that's the biggest, that's the, the, the thing. So we know that technique is pretty robust. And it has been over the years. There's multiple, multiple st um, studies that have been done. I mean, 92 years of history, it's a pretty, pretty good thing. It's kind of like crystallography, you know, it's been around for so long, you know, the theory is very robust. So that's the same type of uh, standard we apply to, but it's a really good question though. Yeah, I, 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 I've done it with many other things and, and you always fear that you're going to overfit, you know, and um, you, can go, you can go forever, you know, and, and do many more. But yeah, yeah, and that's what, yeah, we, we there are standards that we use basically in terms of fitting. So, for example, um, the CFS distribution is a standard that Peter Shook 
came up or Peter Schiff and his, his team came up with over the years as, is basically the gold standard of how to um, display the data and how to fit the data. There are, now, there are many other ways. For example, you know, John Filo's DCDT, which does, it does the same thing, but doesn't have as much resolution, but doesn't give artificial peaks. So what we do, we model the data orthogonally using different solutions mm -hmm. that give us basically the same data. And that's how we confirm that what we're presenting to you is the best you can get and the best you can, you can achieve by this. So we always do author orthogonal modeling to the data. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, the, that's where there's a big knowledge gap, unfortunately, um, in the AUC field. Um, that, you know, a lot of, it, 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 the heavy lifting comes to the analysis and that takes, just takes time. Yeah. And you just can't, you know, come out of, look at one sample and say, hey, I'm going to apply to multiple samples. It doesn't work like that. You have to have that experience um, to really figure out what is real and what is not. My old mentor said to me, it takes about six months to figure out which peak is real or not. <laughs> Wait, and you figure, after a while, you just, you just know, you just see the data. And yeah. again, there's, there's literature that backs it up. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Hey, can you stop sharing your screen? There you go. Thank you so much. Well, if there aren't any other questions, then I guess we'll wrap up our seminar. Thank you, Liz and Lake. Thank you all for attending today's seminar. Throughout the series, we will be featuring individual core facilities and their relevant technologies. We will start out our spring 2021 semester with an overview of Quorum, our new core facilities administrative management system on Tuesday, January 26th. So save the date. Lastly, we welcome your feedback on this new seminar series. Our goal is to make these events interactive. If there are cores or specific technologies you would like for us to feature in the spring 2021 lineup, whether they be part of the centralized core facility portfolio or not, please let us know by filling out the form that will be circulated after the seminar. Stay healthy and safe and see you all in January. Goodbye.